Hi, my name is Sue Schmidt. I am the Nanslo CHEO Project Coordinator for the CHEO Grant. And I wanted to welcome all of you today to make it making a difference in students' lives through use of open educational resources. We have three speakers today who are going to talk on different topics all related to open resources. And I think you'll find their information very valuable and of interest. Um, as you know, this webinar is funded through a United States Department of Labor grant. This product was created by grantees and does not necessarily reflect the official position of the US Department of Labor. The Department of Labor makes no guarantees, warranties, or assurances of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to such information, including any information on link sites, and including but not limited to accuracy of the information or its completeness, completeness timeliness, usefulness, adequacy, continued availability, or ownership. With that, I want to introduce the first speaker for today. Uh, Mary Burgess is the Acting Executive Director for BC Campus. Uh, Mary has a portfolio which includes the BC Open Textbook Project and other open educational resource initiatives, as well as the professional learning offerings and educational communities of practice that support um, that are supported and delivered by BC Campus. Prior to her, her work at BC Campus, Mary was the director for the Center of Teaching and Educational Technologies at Royal Roads University, where she started the university's first OER project. Mary has also worked as an instructional designer at several post-secondary institutions. Mary has a BA in Liberal Arts, sorry, Liberal Studies from the University of Victoria and an MA in Educational Technology from the University of British Columbia. With that, I am going to turn it over to Mary. Mary will actually remember to hit the talk button so everybody can hear me. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. <laughs> And uh, I, I really appreciate being asked to, to talk a, a little bit about our, our contributions to this project. It, it was um, a really uh, interesting way for us to get involved and, and, uh, and make some kind of contribution. So I'm happy to be here chatting about it with you today. So I'm just going to give you a brief um, overview here about what I'm going to talk about in this first part of the webinar. So just so that we're all on the same page, I'm going to do a quick refresher on what I'm talking about when I talk about open and open educational resources. I'm going to give you a few details about our project. If you want more of those, I'm happy to talk to anybody at any time. And there's about a million um, um, presentations on SlideShare from me and from my staff about our project. Um, as you can imagine, uh, since we've been going um, uh, since 2012, we've talked ad nauseum about our project in a lot of different places. So, so there's uh, quite a bit of stuff out online about what we've been doing. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, open text Textbook review process that we use in our project and that we used with uh, CHEO faculty in, um, in doing that. So this is the uh, this is the definition that that we use for openness. It, it's pretty common. In fact, I was laughing with somebody else who does a lot of this work. Um, these are the two things that most people use who uh, do presentations from the open education resource community. Um, we use the Hewlett definition for open educational resources and David Wiley's five R's to define what we consider to be truly open in our work at BC campus. And so I won't read these things because I'm assuming that since you work in higher education you can all read. Um, but uh, but this, is, this is our framework for making decisions about whether something is or isn't open and whether or not we'll actually work on it. So we have a problem, obviously, that, that uh, I'm guessing all of you have recognized since you're in this room as well. Um, and, and that's that's a problem with the traditional model of, uh, of textbook publishing. And of course this is a joke, although frankly I have actually experienced something pretty close to this and we do hear uh, a lot from students about their experiences in trying to um, obtain and pay for textbooks and, and the, the struggles that they go through in doing that. And, um, and so this is just one. Some of the statistics that we're seeing are um, in both Canadian and U.S. institutions that up to 60% of students are not purchasing their textbooks for a variety of reasons, uh, the largest of which being that they can't afford it. 
And so in some cases, they are coming um, to a learning environment without the necessary resources to actually succeed in that environment. And so that's, that's obviously a, a huge issue. Um, so uh, we decided to do something about that in British Columbia. And so in uh, October 2012, our Minister of Advanced Education announced funding uh, of a million dollars for BC campus. And, and we are a government-funded uh, organization, and we support and work with all the public post-secondary institutions in British Columbia, of which there are 25. Uh, so we were asked to produce a set of 40 uh, open textbooks for the most highly enrolled subject areas in British Columbia post-secondary institutions. The following year, in 2013, we were also given another million dollars to produce 20 more textbooks. And those are really in vocational or skills programs, so trades, tourism, technology, healthcare, et cetera. So that's where we're working now. We're about to close up the, uh, the production of the 40 texts. We, are, uh, we now have those 40 textbooks uh, against those. Uh, against that list that, that we uh, generated in order to find out what were the high enrollment um, courses. And so now we're working on the ones for, for the skills program. So how did we get involved with CHEO? So at BC campus, we had had the pleasure of working with the North American Network of Science Labs online for a number of years. And for those who haven't experienced this amazing program, we're talking about uh, labs that students access online um, and have an authentic lab experience um, by actually manipulating lab equipment to do experiments, um, at, but at a distance. So it's a, it's a way of... Um, of bringing science teaching to students at a distance who otherwise might not be able to access that um, because their institutions in their areas don't offer it or they're not in an area that has institutions. So, so we were happy to be part of that group. And, um, and, and as part of the collaboration that we were doing there, uh, Rhonda Epper, who was still uh, at that time working on the project, asked BC Campus, because of the open textbook work we were doing, um, to provide a couple of, uh, of, of textbooks to provide a more open focus to the GEO project. So we committed to, um, to providing two, two of the textbooks that we ultimately uh, would, would produce as part of the project to the CHEO project from ours. Um, and the way that we wanted to do that was really by engaging uh, instructors in doing this. So the our interest is not just in producing texts. In fact, it's much more focused on the adoption of those textbooks. Um, and part of that is because there are already a lot of existing open educational resources, particularly open textbooks that exist. And, and we really wanted to see students get the benefit of those by, uh, by improving the adoption of them. So we were looking for a way to bring CHEO uh, instructors into the fold and, uh, and, and have, have a more open um, focus to the CHEO project. So I'm just going to advance my slide here. So just a little bit more about how we, how we got to the review process. And, and uh, so our project focuses on these three areas that you see here. Phase one is harvest textbooks from other projects and review them. Phase two is to do adaptations of them. And phase three is to create them. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about phases two and three today. I'm just going to focus on phase one. And phase one for us is really an ongoing part of the project. So we are still um, having faculty come and, and, review the, uh, and review the textbooks that we have in our collection and posting those reviews on online. Um, but, uh, but our first step was to go out to uh, a number of different repositories that, that you can see here on the slide. These are some of the places that we found existing open textbooks. Um, and so we pulled those into our repository, had a look at what we had in the repository, and made some decisions about which ones of those textbooks would be appropriate for CHEO instructors. So those are the three that you see here on the slide. So the first two, as you can see, are both from OpenStax College, which is out of Rice University. And they produce extremely high quality, uh, very comprehensive textbooks. 
that are really meant to be um, adapted to uh, the context of an institution or an, a, an individual instructor. Um, like when I say they're comprehensive, I mean they are massive tomes. And so the idea is really for faculty to just pull out the chapters or the content that they want to use with, uh, with their students. The middle textbook you can see there, the introductory uh, chemistry one, is from, uh, it's, that's an adaptation that we did of another textbook. So we had some chemistry faculty in BC review that text, uh, the original text, and make suggestions about what needed to be changed in it to improve the quality. And so we did that work with them, and so this is the first Canadian edition of that textbook. So these are the textbooks that, um, that we wanted to have reviewed. So the, the one barrier was that at BC campus, we have lots of connections to uh, faculty in British Columbia, but not faculty who are teaching in the CHEO project. So Pat Shea was very helpful um, by emailing a whole whack of instructors to make them aware, aware that we were looking for reviewers. And specifically, we wanted people who were actually teaching in the subject so that they would have the expertise to do the reviews. Uh, and we heard from about 20 faculty who were interested in doing that. So, we have a set of review criteria, and I was happy to see that uh, I think it was Kate's slides looked like they're going to break these down a little bit more. Uh, so this is, this is the set of review criteria that we use with faculty in British Columbia and that we used with, uh, with instructors from the CHEO program. So the process is that when an instructor expresses interest in uh, reviewing one of our textbooks, we send a link to the, to the textbook itself and a link to an online form where all of these criteria are listed. Uh, and then the instructor does the review, fills in the online form, and we send them a check for $250. Each textbook gets um, not just a rating against these, but also narrative feedback against them. Um, and the texts that we had reviewed by, those three texts that we had reviewed by CHEO faculty were all pretty highly rated ultimately. Lots of, uh, the scale is uh, out of one to five. Uh, lots, so there was lots of fives, some fours, and a few threes. But really they, they, did, they did pretty well, so, so we were happy with that. Um, so, and just, um, I don't know if I said this already, I don't think so. So despite the fact that we had 20 people express interest, about nine people completed reviews, nine, not about nine people completed reviews, and that's actually pretty typical for our project. We find people are gung-ho initially, obviously, and then they get teaching and it's well, just something that they can't continue with. And so, so we were not expecting everybody to complete and sure enough everybody didn't complete, but that's okay. Um, and so I just wanted to show you, we've provided the reviews that the CHEO faculty did um, along with the textbooks to the project and they'll be displaying those reviews along with the textbooks in their repository. The way that we do it uh, in our repository is that the reviews get posted along with the textbooks and the ratings. So you can see on this slide what that looks like. You can also see who the reviewer was, what institution they were with, and, and, and the narrative feedback that they gave against, um, against each of the textbooks. If you're interested in having a look at these, feel free to peruse our site. It's at uh, open.bccampus.ca. Uh, open I'll have it at the end. Oh, Gina Bennett just joined the session. Hi, Gina. I know Gina. Uh, and so, uh, so we provided this information to, uh, to, the CHEO, um, to the CHEO group so that they can um, complete that review, or complete that work and have the reviews posted online. So uh, we have had some, some quite good results. And actually, this uh, as of a couple of days ago, <laughs> from when I sent the slides to Sue, our numbers are slightly better. Uh, so we actually now have 83 um, books in our collection. Uh, we have 81, uh, 85 reviews of 41 of those texts. So not every one of our textbooks have re been reviewed. We would love it if that would happen. Um, but we're just continuing to really beat the bushes on that and, uh, and get people in where we can to, to come in and do a review. Um, and um, we have 143 known adoptions in our system, in our post-secondary system. That's a place where we've really struggled to get good data because when, uh, when faculty adopt an open textbook, really all they have to do is give their students a link to the textbook in 
our collection. They don't have to tell the bookstore. They don't have to tell us. And so it's difficult for us to actually collect good data there. Um, so we suspect that there are quite a bit um, more adoptions than what we're actually seeing. Uh, and at this point, we have, um, <laughs> I see I didn't take out this, this slide. As you can probably notice is that we, uh, we, I've used this slide in another presentation recently. We have 14 of our 25 institutions participating, but none from Sun Fraser University, which is where I used this slide last. And this actually is probably of interest to you guys too, because where we have the most um, barriers in terms of getting people to adopt, uh, we have that problem the most at the research institutions versus the teaching institutions. So we think there are some cultural issues going on there around tenure track and, uh, and what's acceptable within a discipline uh, in terms of what people are working on and, 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 uh, and what they're researching, etc. Uh, and our known student savings to date is uh, $706,221. Again, we think it's higher than that because of the adoptions, but uh, because of not knowing about all the adoptions, but that's a pretty good number, uh, we feel, um, this far along. I just wanted to give you an idea of the impact uh, that you can have just in one course and, and the impact you can have on your students' lives. So Tax Sato is one of our instructors and actually he's been somewhat involved in the CHEO project as well, so I wanted to use him as an example here. Uh, so he has uh, saved students $60,000 just in one course at his one institution, right? So, so there really is um, a lot of, uh, of impact that can be had by just one individual instructor making a change. Um, and, and we're thrilled to have TAC and, and many other um, faculty in British Columbia really um, advocating along with us now um, and providing a, a really uh, strong academic focus that, um, that we're happy to have as part of our project. So that's my spiel. I'm happy to answer questions now or at the end. I invite you to visit our collection and use whatever you find there that is of use to you. You don't, like I said, you don't have to tell us. Just go and have a look, and uh, and we would be happy to have you use our materials. Thank you, Mary, and um, for everyone participating in this webinar, webinar, just remember that you can post questions to the chat area, or you can also click on the talk button if you have a question um, and ask that question. There is a hand raising tool, it's an icon uh, that looks like a hand, so if you want to ask a question but someone is rolling on their presentation, just uh, raise your hand as well, and then um, we'll find an opportunity for you to ask that question as well verbally or, as I mentioned, through the chat window. All right, our next speaker will be Kate Lormand, and Kate is the CHEO curriculum lead in biology, and she is also adjunct faculty for CCC Online, Great Falls College, Montana State University, and Missouri Valley College. Kate has over 20 years of experience teaching in the community college level in biology, anatomy, and physiology, genetics, and botany for both majors and non-majors. Her experience includes both traditional face-to-face -face and online teaching. Additionally, Kate worked on the development of an online biology course through the Monterey Institute, and she wrote the online text as well as created activities and learning objectives for those chapters. Kate, I'm turning it over to you. Well, thank you, Sue. Um, it's great to be here with everybody today. Um, and it was great to hear Mary's presentation because she's a great lead-in for what I did. I was one of those nine people who actually com um, committed to and finished one of the reviews on the biology book. And so I'm just going to talk. I think you'll find this a little bit brief, perhaps, because this it's a review process. A lot of us have already reviewed books. This is a, but um, it was it was an interesting process, and I think that, uh, it was well worth it. So here we go. Um, there's a huge importance of having open source um, textbooks, as Mary mentioned. The cost is um, incredible for students 
who are trying to figure out not only how to pay for college, but then to pay for the textbooks on top of just getting into the class. Um, and if they're in an online science class, they might additionally have a lab kit that's part of their um, fees. And so being able to provide a free textbook that the instructor is really committed to and believes in is a huge help to students. The availability is another big issue for kids, kids, college students, uh, because they, if they don't have at the ability to buy the text, just being able to have it online um, really helps them be able to have it wherever they are and utilize it. Uh, again, the process of peer reviewing is, of course, a critical piece of any science um, process. We need to be able to read through and evaluate what is presented. Um, and so it gives it a level of um, credibility as far as science goes when we do peer-reviewed processes. Um, the fact that they can be customized is awesome. Um, I'm looking at customizing some uh, chemistry textbooks for a high school um, class that's a, a hybrid, so they'll do their labs in the high school, but they want an online lecture and course that runs alongside of that. And so these are high school students taking a college level class. So I want to be able to make sure that the textbook that I choose that I can customize it to work with that particular uh, student population. Right now, I feel like online textbooks are really still troublesome for a lot of students, um, particularly traditional students who are used to that, um, that paper book. They like to be able to turn pages. They like to be able to highlight in it. And so I've had a lot of um, students when I've tried to use an online book really say, well, can we print out and just use this as a regular book? You know, that that's a, a hard thing for students to get used to using a tri uh, an online book. Although now we're learning more and more about how to highlight within a book online and it's making students, I think, more and more comfortable with it, as well as we're having a whole new generation of learners who are learning with online books from the from earlier ages. And so I think online textbooks and open textbooks are going to become hugely important as we move towards the future. So why did I say I would do it? <laughs> um, Using peer review of open textbooks and other learning um, content really does provide the quality assurance necessary to make um, sharing viable. We want to make sure that when I'm talking about meiosis or mitosis, that I'm, I'm teaching it in a way that is similar to how someone else might teach it. We can't share this information without making sure that we have that quality, the same level of quality. Um, and then again, experts contribute to peer reviews by number one, selecting the appropriate content for the review and evaluating um, their content based on the standard criteria and then sharing your, their feedback. So um, this is just how when we approach these textbooks, we want these things to happen. Um, and so I, I just pulled those quotes from the College Open Textbooks um, as to why people choose to do this. So the process of the review for the OER textbooks through BC Campus is that the reviewers were asked to participate given the selection to review. In this case, it was an entire textbook, which was quite daunting, um, to be honest. Um, and provided then with the series of questions, um, and I'll go into those questions in more detail, but you got a sort of a preview of them from what Mary presented. And then we were given a time frame to complete the review. So here come the review questions. So we're looking for comprehensiveness. So the specific question that we were asked to look at when we were evaluating the text was um, the text covers all areas 
and ideas of the subject appropriately and provides an effective, an effective index and or glossary. Um, so the way I approached um, this presentation was just to give you some sample comments. And these are primarily my comments um, that I um, did when I did my review. And so again, here we're just looking for, are we covering the majority of the things that a traditional, you know, paper, hardback textbook for majors level biology would include. And so um, as I went through the textbook, I came up with, um, I thought it was a really good textbook. I said the text appears to be very comprehensive and matches the content of other majors level biology textbooks, such as the um, Campbell biology text, which um, in the U.S. this is sort of the, the uh, I don't know if you say the Bible of college level biology. Everybody um, likes to use Campbell as a as a textbook. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I liked the glossary a whole lot. I thought it was very comprehensive. Um, it had a useful listing of the keywords with definitions at the end of each chapter. So rather than just having those words highlighted in the chapter or in bold in the chapter, they had the list at the end of the chapter. Um, and then you could go ahead and find them also at the at the back of the book in the glossary. It's a good idea, and one of my suggestions would be to have some key terms at the beginning of the chapter, not definitions per se, but things that the student ought to be looking out for. Um, and I'm right now I'm teaching at a charter school as well, teaching high school and um, middle school science. And one of the things that I've learned about my students at that level is that they don't know how to use a textbook as a resource. And so I'm continually saying, what are the keywords that we're going to be looking for as we start this chapter? And so those textbooks are set up in that way where they give you learning objectives and key terms. And I make the kids write them out right from the very beginning so that they can go through their textbook chapter and I'll say, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, prophase, that was one of our key terms. Let's go back and, you know, remind them of that. So in these online textbooks, I think that that would be a nice thing to do as well, to give some sort of learning objectives and key terms as they begin the process. You're also looking for content accuracy. So is it right? You know, we don't want to be presenting um, a textbook that doesn't have accurate content. And so the specific question we're looking for here or topic is content including diagrams and other supplementary material is accurate, error-free, and unbiased. And so some of the things that I found in my process um, was that the, they, these tend to be very specific errors. So we, we were looking at very little things and when we were doing this. Um, that each evaluator finds are often based on each evaluator's um, area of expertise. For me to be evaluating, um, I'm trying to think of a topic that I feel really uncomfortable in, <laughs> um, let's say self signaling is not one of the areas that I feel really solid in. So as I'm reading that chapter, I kept thinking, uh, I'm not sure I know enough about this to really, you know, accurately answer these questions um, and look for errors here. Um, and then it, as we get towards the end of my presentation, you'll see I felt like the process overall should have been broken into subject areas for the reviewers for some of the questions, but for other questions, I think having the whole textbook to look at was hugely important. Um, we also need to look at biases as different authors have different approaches to topics um, based on their education and, and their location. Um, and that was something that came up a couple of times in the review process was um, we would notice like spelling differences between a U.S. spelling of something and a French spelling or a Canadian spelling of something. <coughs> Sorry. 
Um, relevance and longevity. Okay, so again, you know, looking at something that we all sort of feel like is a standard is the Campbell textbook. Um, and so we want to make sure that whatever um, we see in this textbook is up to date um, and very current. Um, so they're looking specifically for content is up to date, but not in a way that will quickly make the text obsolete within a shorter period of time. And is the text written and or arranged in such a way that, a ne that necessary updates will be relatively easy and straightforward to implement? So in other words, if there's a change to something um, in one particular chapter, can we change it just in that chapter? Or is that concept um, spread throughout the textbook? And so when, the, when an update is made, then we have to go into all these different areas where we will be um, updating that particular uh, idea. So um, things that I ran across, I just felt like we have a much better understanding of Archaea and their origins than is presented in the chapter one of this textbook. Um, and so the introduction of the domains and the division of the kingdoms is a great way to introduce students to the way science changes as we get more information. And so that was a personal comment and I don't, you know, I don't want to belabor you guys with my um, biases on things. <laughs> but that's one of my, the things that I tend to key in on and so that was what my comment on that was. Is the text clear? So is it written in a lucid, accessible prose um, and does it provide adequate context for any jargon um, or technical terminology used. So for example, um, I felt like some of the terminology was very simplistic for a majors level book, um, but it did a really good job of explaining the concepts. Um, and sometimes the terms uh, were introduced prior to the explanation. And so again, I think this comes from my um, current place as um, teaching middle school and high schoolers, if they see or read a term before it's defined, it throws them. And so as I was reading through the, <clears throat> the textbook um, during the review process, I was sort of keying in on things like that because I know what throws my current students. And that was one thing I found. I've run across a couple of times the term would be presented but not defined until later. Is everybody doing okay? Yes, so yes, nobody's raising their hand saying no. <laughs> in terms of consistency, um, is the text in, internally consistent in terms of terminology and framework? Yeah, so we don't want, because of course there's multiple writers for these books, but we want it to flow from one um, if one person wrote one chapter and somebody else writes another chapter, you don't want to have a change in style, essentially. Um, so how do we look at the terminology? Is everybody using the same words to explain things? Um, are we using the same structure? Um, and again, I found that very consistent within this textbook, but again, I ran into that issue with the term being used prior to being identified. Uh, modularity. <clears throat> so the text, the, this, you know, you have to like think, well, what is modularity? Okay, it's making it into a module. So the text is easily and readily, <clears throat> readily divisible into smaller reading sections that can be assigned at different points within the course. So, um, for example, enormous blocks of text without subheadings should be avoided. You don't want to say, oh, you know, I want you to read this section without being able to say, start at this section, stop when you get to this point. You need to break it up into those sort of chunking, again, that's a new education, edu babble term. We like to chunk things um, so that students can break it into pieces that make sense to them. Um, <clears throat> so the text should not be overly self-referential and should be easily reorganized and realigned with various subunits of a course without presenting too much, too much disruption to the reader. So if I wanted to, um, say, just pull out photosynthesis and respiration, 
I should be able to do that and have it flow without feeling like, oh gosh, I can't do that because they refer back to prokaryotes and eukaryotes too much, and so I need to add that chapter or that section in as well. <clears throat> and so we want to make sure that as we set these books up, that the, the sections are organized and chunkable for a reader or for someone who is building a course and wanting to customize um, what pieces of the textbook they're using. <coughs> I haven't had a cold or anything. I don't know why I have a cough now. <laughs> the chapters should easily um, build on one another but could be used independently of, of, one, of, the, of, bleh, of one another as well. In terms of organization, um, again, looking at structure, flow, topics in the text are presented in a logical and clear fashion. Um, again, you don't want to be introducing one concept that doesn't make sense to be the first concept if it is something that typically follows um, another topic. For example, um, and I run into this um, sometimes, people will introduce mitosis and then genetics, and then meiosis. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, why would you do that? The flow ought to be this. And so um, in this particular textbook, we were looking to see if the topics in the text were presented in a logical and clear fashion. Um, so for, for me in reviewing this, the, um, the text tended to, I focused primarily on the comparison of this open source textbook to some of the more commonly used textbooks, which in this case was Campbell uh, for me, and an Anger uh, Ross non-majors bio textbook um, that I tend to use in a in a non-major setting. And I felt like in this for this book it was very it flowed very nicely. Um, classic looking for grammatical errors. Um, check to see that the text contains no grammatical errors. So again, as a reviewer, you're focusing on looking over the text for any obvious grammatical errors. This is one of those areas where I really felt like somebody else should be doing this. I'm not a very good proofreader, and again, when you know the content, you tend to read for the content and, and miss the, the grammatical errors because your brain is already telling you what you're going to read next. Um, and, and I assume, and Mary, maybe you could address this in the question answers, but there was somebody who was also looking at it just specifically for grammar um, and that that wasn't necessarily the subject matter or the content reviewers. <clears throat> yes, Mary says, yes, we have editors who work on the text for us. That's good to know because I blew through <laughs> those, those like, oh, should that be a comma? I don't know. i got to keep going. Uh, the interface, uh, the text is tree of significant interface issues, including navigation problems, distortion of images, charts, and or any other display features that might distract or confuse the re reader. This is a huge issue for me um, when I, because I am a traditional textbook person. So for me to read a textbook online, I will, if there, if the fonts change, um, if the diagrams are too small or appear blurry, I lose interest, I lose focus, and so it's a very important aspect for any textbook um, and a big piece of the um, reviewer's process um, to make sure that it can be read on a device and there's not those distortions and navigation issues um, because if you've got those, you're going to distract the reader from comprehension. At least I know I'm very distracted if I'm like, well, wait a minute, why does that thought change? Or that picture seems really small, I can't quite see it big enough. Um, and so that's, it's one of those things that you look for in a traditional review, but maybe not as thoroughly as, or the impact is greater, I think, in an online setting, in an online um, e-text. Cultural relevance, um, again, this is one of those things that just, because this textbook is a BC um, textbook, and we wanted to make sure that the cult text was not culturally insensitive or offensive in any way. It should make use of any examples that are 
<clears throat> inclusive of a variety of races, ethnicities, and backgrounds. So um, I felt like there was some te terminology that seemed American, but it wasn't um, unfamiliar, so it wouldn't really be a problem in other cultures. And then, um, so just one of those things that I think, you know, anybody who reads it might go, well, what, why would they say that? But um, overall, it's, it's to uh, connect with the student overall. Um, then you get an other, okay, so if you have any other um, comments, you would put them in that last category and thinking about what year and what the text level um, is for that particular book, okay. So my pros and cons after doing this was, as a pro, you get to see the entire layout for the text. Um, and that was really nice. I mean, other reviews I've done have been very limited in that you get a chapter. Um, and so you don't really see how that whole book is going to go together. Um, and it's also awesome to be part of a new direction in textbook. I mean, our education is moving in this direction and we want to make sure that our textbooks are also keeping up with that and then it does provide such an awesome um, resource for students to be able to have the um, text available to them at uh, low or no cost. The negatives for me, it's a volunteer project. Um, $250 was, it was great. I got to go out to a nice dinner afterwards. Um, but to sit and, you know, read through a 1,400-page book is a lot. Um, and I felt, again, that it was too much to effectively cover, particularly for me when there were some topics that I just didn't feel like I could, you know, look at it from a content expertise. So those chapters I looked for, the text and the flow of it, and, you know, were there, um, things that um, jumped out at me grammatically, but I didn't focus so much on the content um, in that setting. And I think that's, oh, oh, I have recommendations. So um, I did like having the entire book to look through, but I feel like it was tough to give the entire text a full read. Um, it would be nice if we could just have access to the text, um, but have the reviewers focus on smaller sections, like, okay, Kate, you're going to do chapters one through five, and I'd be like, great, okay, but I could see the whole book, and I could see where the concepts in those early chapters would flow into um, the next sections of the book. Um, I guess I just sort of said that, right, right, this would allow the reviewer to focus on the areas of expertise and give a more thorough evaluation. Um, and then again, I, and I think Mary has already said this, that to have, they do have reviewers that are looking at the full textbook for interface, cultural relevance, and the grammatical stuff. And so if we have any questions, again, we can deal with those at the end of the session. But thank you all for listening to my ramble. Thank you so much, Kate. That was great. So um, next, I am going to introduce Patty Green. And uh, Patty is the biology faculty at Tacoma Community College. She teaches anatomy and physiology and microbiology. She has developed both the pre-nursing anatomy and physiology and microbiology course curriculum in hybrid online forums. And just as a little background, when I was doing research on OER, I came across Tacoma Community College and found out that uh, they were very active in implementing OER in at their college and with the purpose of saving money for their students. And actually, uh, they have used, as I understand it, student fees to support OER uh, project work. So with that, I am going to advance to the next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to Patty. And I see Patty right now is trying to use her microphone, but it appears that it might not work. Um, Patty, can you quickly uh, provide information in the chat window if your mic isn't working? 
Um, I think she's doing an audio setup wizard. Um, Patty, as well, you can go up to tools, telephony, and use the telephone for your audio if your microphone is not working now. She had tested it earlier. So I'm going to um, hold for just a second. And while we're waiting for Patty to get her uh, voice communication working, are there some questions that we can pose to the current speakers? Um, I'll, I will turn that question over to Patty when she gets online. Um, but my understanding is that uh, I don't know that they had to increase fees. I think they just had some and redirected them. Um, Patty's indicating, but the sound is starting to cut out in the last talk for me. So Patty, would you please go up to Tools, Telephony, and say, use your telephone for audio. And it will give you a telephone number and a PIN number to use to access this Blackboard Collaborate session. So you can go ahead and do your presentation. Sorry for the delay on this. I'm sure that Patty will be able to connect with us shortly via the telephone. Um, again, as uh, Mary noted, the TCC pro project was uh, very interesting. They do have their own website. They actually hired, um, as I reviewed it, hired an OER coordinator um, so that uh, they could actually get this thing moving along and um, you know, dedicated a lot of resources to make it happen. Yes, Quill West. I okay, hear can someone you hear now. Me? We can hear you now, Patty. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And Patty, do you know how to advance the slide? There's the button at top, I assume. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So my name is Patty Green. I'm a biology instructor at Tacoma Community College. And I started using OER around 2011. I was actually on the hiring committee when we started our OER project. We hired Crow West, who was our OER coordinator. And it is wonderful as a faculty trying to learn to use OER to have someone like that on campus. So from, you know, at TCC, there were a handful of faculty, and I was one of them, that were already involved with trying to move our classes to OER resources. And what I want to talk about in some of my experience with it, why I decided to try to use OER, how I approached trying to use OER in my classes, and what were some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks that I had in using OER. <coughs> The biggest, I started both teaching at a community college, and the first quarter I taught here, I had no idea what I had to cost. I was teaching an anatomy and physiology class, and you know, another instructor said they always had the students hand in the labs at the end. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And then, you know, how could you explore those students? Like, you yeah, know, this was $180 textbook that you had to be looking pages out of. It was like, oh my god, really? Sorry. And when I got involved with OER, it was when I realized that our students spend, on average, you know, almost the third of the cost of their tuition they spend on books. And we have students who sleep in their cars. So it was just that the drive to get textbook costs down for me, you know, seemed an important part of my teaching that why use a textbook if my students can't afford it. And the classes I teach are mostly sort of pre allied health type classes. Anatomy, physiology, microbiology, nutrition. And those books, I mean, I think all textbooks are getting new editions so quickly, but those can be really bad. And it's not really expensive. I mean, for my anatomy course, when I started teaching here, they were spending close to $400. 
uh, a textbook and a lab book together, and over three hundred dollars in microbiology. <coughs> So when we started, you know, there's sort of two different ways. And what most people say when you start talking about using OER, they go, don't do it all at once. It's overwhelming, you'll never start it. Just do a little bit. You know, so get your toes in the water, find a few things you like. Ready to find. The problem is I don't simply what's her name. I just sort of dive off the deep end. And part of it is that if my students are going to have, if I'm still going to have to have them buy a $300 textbook, you know, I have yet to find any OER resource that I actually think is better than the textbook. And so if they have to buy the textbook anyway, why would I want to have, have to have them read something substandard to help just touch a little bit? I didn't find it really worked well to try to, you know, if they're buying the textbook in a science class, they're buying the textbook. You sort of have to go all in or not. That said, I found it a lot easier to start with lab. Lab manuals are a great way to start cutting down the cost. And often work really, really well in an OER format. A lot of Instructors like to write their own labs anyway. There's a difference between just writing your own labs for your use and writing them as OER content. It's making sure that you're not stealing the publisher's images, but you're actually using OER CC by licensed images and making it publicly available. One of the other things that I found interesting about using OER materials is they sort of naturally led me to learning how to design my classes using a backwards design method. And you know what that is is instead of starting out with, okay, here's this textbook, that's what I'm teaching, I found that using OER really made me start from the learning objectives of my class. What is it that they need to learn? What what are the primary concepts, ideas, and skills I need them to come out of the class knowing? And from there, determining how I would assess whether or not they had those, that knowledge, and then choosing the resources based on what would get me there. And in a way that using a textbook, it's really easy just to jump in and go, Okay, this is the textbook I'm teaching from. This is the material I'm going to teach. I found that using OER really, really pushed me to using backwards design in all of my classes, starting with what my students need to know and looking from there backwards to the textbook. And you know, there's really two different ways, and I've been both of them of using OER. One is just the same as picking a textbook. You find a textbook that covers all the learning objectives. And when I first started doing this, there weren't very many available. I mean, OpenStax textbooks for AMT became available way afterwards. Um, Carnegie Mellon had the first one that was sort of an intact textbook that um, I found to try to use. Using, finding an OER textbook it's still a lot of work for the faculty member, but it's less overwhelming than the other way of doing it, which is actually what I end up preferring, which is piecing together different OER content from different sources to make them actually make a mosaic that actually fits in with what you're teaching and what the learning outcomes are for your class. In the first, you're becoming a textbook evaluator, a textbook reviewer. And the second, you're becoming, you know, a bit more of an editor and an author. The biggest problem I found with switching to OER, by far the biggest problem, is time. The faculty are already pushed, and I, I, mean, I ran here straight from microbiology lab. We already have very limited free time. And maybe your institutions differ, but here it feels like more and more responsibility are getting pushed on us all the time. 
And switching over to OER does take a lot of faculty time. When I started doing this, there was no one around to find good sources for OER. And even after we had a dedicated OER coordinator, Crawl was very really good at helping me find the licensing for something or maybe suggest a couple of places that I might look. But I still had to be the one going out and looking for textbooks for my particular field, reading them, evaluating them, trying to figure out how to use them. And it takes, you know, even in the best situation, it takes a lot of time. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I felt like I was shifting the textbook cost off my students and onto me by investing my time. And, you know, especially what I found best about OER is when I piece together different content that makes my, you know, that puts my story together for the students. That where it comes across a little bit more of what I think is important. And that really takes a lot of time. You know, it's, in some ways, I, I felt like I've authored a couple of textbooks in the past four years. The other thing that adds a lot of time that's often not talked about is that the publishers really give us a lot of material. The online platforms with some of the publishers can be really awesome. There's test banks, I, mean, I don't really use those, but some people do. The slides, the support materials. The two things that I find most beneficial from the publishers that I haven't seen replicated well in OER are technical support. For, um, some of the OER publishers have online materials, but there's usually not really good technical support for the students. And especially when it comes to anatomy and physiology, the quality of the images are way better in the publisher textbook. But, you know, art is something that I've come to realize we have our students pay for. The early on textbooks, there have become the open text AMP textbook. There's a couple of things I don't like about it, but it's a decent anatomy textbook. It's lots of a time commitment in customizing your own courses. The downside is in some ways, it's not much different than using any other kind of textbook. It's a textbook. With the great benefit being that it's free. But here's, I found a huge variation in quality between the different OER textbooks. And I probably spent more time looking at the AMP anatomy physiology textbooks than any of them. But there's a huge difference in the quality of the writing, the accuracy, the quality of the figures. Some of them really don't have a lot of instructor resources. I mean, we see everything from none to some are better fleshed out. And in general, as I said, I generally find the quality of the images and pictures and figures not to be as good in the open source textbook. <laughs> what I love about OER is that it's customizable. When I put together an OER textbook for my class and piece it together out of all kinds of different readings, it really tells the students the story that I want them to hear. It, it fits incredibly well with what I'm teaching. The downside to that is it's also very individual. The writings that I piece together work well for my teaching, but they don't necessarily work as well for the teaching of my colleagues. But the great thing about CC BY licensing and having more open source materials is it doesn't have to be a one size fits all solution. You know, in classes where different people will put different emphasis on different organ systems, you can have a chapter that covers it completely and a chapter that does more of an overview coverage, and people can choose which one they want for their class. And with one of our online classes, we've done that a lot. We will have, with the resources we put together, we will have a couple of different chapters that cover it in depth. And so people can choose to cover these five organ systems in great depth, and you know, these six or seven at a more moderate depth. The customization is also one of the reasons I think OER is awesome for laboratory manuals. Because often when you get into a lab, Lab manuals are written for some hypothetical lab with these 
exact things available that doesn't always fit in with when you walk into your lab and you start teaching your students. And so a lot of people end up right into doing labs anyway. And a lot of manuals just work perfectly for OER because <clears throat> you can take the content and modify it to be exactly, if you don't use that machine, you use this machine, you change the wording because the licensing allows you to reuse it that way. <laughs> and my favorite thing about OER is by hand picking material, it creates a narrative. And this is, I never really thought about it that way until I was surveying my students because in every class I've used with textbooks I tend to survey my students about their perception of the textbooks and if they think they would have preferred this or that. And one of my students said that it was a microbiology student where I taught <coughs> it early on one quarter where I hand picked very different readings for every subject. And she said that it ended up feeling a lot more like a novel and the information felt more connected. And it was something I found odd because I pieced it together from so many different sources that is very different terms, very different writing style. There was even some different terminology. But one of the interesting things that came through when I surveyed my students is they felt like all the pieces that I picked for them to read flared so well with my lecture that it, it, the words narrative and story came up a lot. And it, it, was sort of, it really surprised me because there was so much variation in the writing style and terms. I thought they'd hate it. <clears throat> I've taught a number of classes with open education resources. The thing that is, has probably been the best for us is um, I self-authored an anatomy physiology lab manual that we use here. You know, I wrote a first draft of it and you know strong on my colleagues into fixing all my mistakes and misspellings and oh my God, did I really say that that badly? <clears throat> and we started, we switched from having all of our students buy a lab manual that was $135 to having all of our anatomy physiology classes use the textbook that we wrote here at PCC. We've made it available online. And in the first year that we had our OER coordinator, she determined that we saved students $85,000 in textbook costs. The bulk of it actually came from the anatomy physiology textbook. I've taught the anatomy physiology sequence using two different OER textbooks. Um, you know, I used the Carnegie Mellon when it was still in a beta testing stage, and there were some interesting things about it. The Carnegie Mellon textbooks have a lot of interactive online materials, but there were also some you're limited to within their computer system, <laughs> and there were some huge downsides with that as well. I didn't choose to use it again. I tried OpenStax when it first came out. There were some accuracy issues in a couple of the chapters that I was really unhappy with. We also teach a one quarter human biology class that's sort of like an AMP overview for certain health fields. And I linked together a number of readings for that class using publicly available websites. If this isn't so much OER resources, but <coughs> For a non-majors level of human biology, it turns out the National Institute on Health has an amazing website that covers at about the right level. And I could link together almost most of the textbook using those type of sites. And for the ones I couldn't find good sources on, I took a chapter out of an OER text here and there. And I found that didn't work as well when I taught that class in a face-to-face -face format. The students hated it. They're like, please pick a textbook. But when I taught the class in an online-only format, the students loved it. So I, I think the teaching format, whether it's a face-to-face -face class or an online class or a hybrid class, has a lot to do with how, at least in my experience, my students respond to how I give them this information. I've also taught microbiology using you know, publicly available websites, some OER textbooks, and 
I actually tell it using a lot of current journals, a lot of scientific American articles and things like that, which is actually like open education resource, but it also gets away from student textbook cost. And we're currently working on you know, putting together a lab book that we use for microbiology for, for a cost of different instructors, still doing a, a little bit of negotiation on some details. And I've used an OER textbook from Kansas State on human nutrition. I think for the right level of nutrition class, that would be an awesome textbook and it's well used. For us, it was a little heavier in the nutrition that our, many of our students can deal with. And so we chose chosen to stop using it. And this is sort of like when I piece together things, this is what I give my students is I make an HTML page that I put in the class where by day I have links to what they should read. And they've usually found it convenient and at least they know what they're going to read. When I talk to my students about what they don't like about OER, what they really don't like are reading online. A lot of them want a physical book, even at the same time that they say they don't want to read online, they say they don't want to carry a book around. But the biggest complaint I hear from my students is that they don't like reading online. From a faculty perspective, my biggest concern with it is it takes a lot of my time. Oh, another student concern. Uh, computer access. I have oddly ended up with students taking full online classes off of a cell phone. And some of the OER materials that I've used, and the Carnegie Mellon OER textbook was one of them, <clears throat> it, students had a lot of issues if they didn't have a typical computer. Those materials were not very accessible on tablets and phones. And I'm surprised by how many students I have take online classes that don't have computers. <clears throat> One of the things I like about OER and where I've had the best luck with it in response to my student responses is that it integrates so well into online classes. The students are focusing their learning in an online situation, the online course materials just become part of the course. They have to get online to deal with, the, to take the test, to take the quiz, to do whatever they have to do for your class anyway, the online material just seem to integrate into it in a way that makes the whole more cohesive. There are, you know, the best I hear back from my students about it is that they like that it's free. Outside of that, they Generally, say that they like that different perspectives, especially when I handpick different bits of materials, that they're learning not just from a single textbook, getting a unified opinion or perspective on the field, but that by piecing together multiple sources, it lets them see some of the things that people disagree on or different ways of thinking about things because it isn't consistent. And I know in the last talk I'm about consistency in textbooks, and that's awesome and a textbook should be. But sometimes the students actually gain a lot from seeing different perspectives and having a little bit of a lack of consistency. And so and sadly, a lot of my students said that it was less intimidating. Just dealing chapter by chapter with what I put online was somehow way less intimidating to them and easier to digest them thinking, oh my god, I'm going to read this whole textbook. So the, the lab manual that we self-offered here, we came really close to 100% of our students preferring a lab manual, and we did that over <clears throat> about eight different instructors' classes. You know, on this, I survey my students every time I use an OER textbook, and I find that typically I'm getting about half my students preferring an OER textbook to an actual publisher textbook. Um, <clears throat> now, it sort of varies between you know, students to students, but 
And I definitely see a stronger preference for OER in my online classes than my face-to-face -face classes. <clears throat> and you know, this is some survey results that we've been. Um, I mean, so these survey classes are mostly face-to-face, -face, and I took some slightly old survey results from um, the TCC OER project because I had about 80 students that were hopefully answering the survey that both of these quarters. And most of them paid small level of um, Many at some point during the class, because even with OER materials, many students print them, and that comes at a cost. Um, most students who access OER are accessing it online, which is part of the reason I find it fits way better in my online classes than in my face-to-face -face classes. Many of them actually really liked it. You know, they felt it was understandable. They were too. <coughs> Many of them have also taken other courses here that have used open education resources. And that number has been increasing on TCC campus. At this point, a lot of our English 101, 102 classes are getting taught using OER. And we're getting more communication classes taught using OER as well. In the room now, all of my labs are using OER. I'm using it as supplemental reading. I'm using my, the OER resources in my online classes. And in some of my face-to-face -face classes, I've actually gone back to publish your textbooks. Um, and part of the reason is now that I have all of my classes where I have an OER alternative that I'm happy with, I find that it's still not quite as good as what the publisher can offer. And I found they've been much more willing to negotiate with me on price of the textbooks. You know, if when I was looking for a microbiology textbook, the publisher gave a price, and it's like, oh, if my students are going to have to pay $125, I'm just going to use the OER material. My students are paying $85. You know, they're getting it as an ebook with an extra $20 if they want a print copy. Many of them just use the ebook. You know, I, some of them really do like the print copy. But the cost has come down, you know, even though I'm not using a publisher textbook, it's a third of what they were paying when I first started teaching the course. <clears throat> and, you know, so the biggest benefit for me is it works awesome in my lab. I have backups now. If I have a student who really needs a textbook and doesn't have it, I have all those OER materials together. But for my students who can't afford it, there's a lot of benefits to using a publisher textbook. I do like many of the issues that, you know, some of the support that they have, the instructor resources and activities, can be really, really useful. And that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you so much, Patty. And with that, I want to open it up to questions. Um, I have noticed that there were a lot of comments taking place on the chat board about textbooks and online textbooks and using them and not using them. I think there's been some real good discussion, but I do want to open it up just briefly for any additional questions. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking through this now. It feels sort of a small window on my computer. You know, I've often wondered if it is like something we have to gradually get them used to, but I'm finding with time my students, you know, over the four to five years I've been doing this, my students have been changing. They're much more comfortable with online textbooks now than they were four years ago. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that. Um, at least at TCC Online, the students that initially everybody was like, well, okay, but I still want to buy a hard copy. And now, as Tack mentioned, less than 2% of the students that buy a hard, you know, say they want to buy, a, I don't know, let's see, less than 2% of the students who say they, you know, really want one actually buy one. So 
I think students are getting the hang of it, but it's not for everybody. I think we still are going to have to have the option of either printing out the material for students um, that want it or allowing them to buy a hard copy. No, I think that's very true. I know one value of OER is for those students who can afford text, I know that um, when I used to teach, I mean, I had students that we were three weeks mm -hmm. into the course and they hadn't bought the textbook yet because they couldn't afford it. So by providing a different option for them, like an OER textbook is helpful. They have it day one of the class instead of waiting two or three weeks into the class when they might be able to afford it. And if it is OER, the other value to that is as an instructor, I, you know, because of copyright issues, I couldn't print off my book and give it to them. I had to be very careful of that. But if right. I have an OER book, I can print it off for them and I'm, you know, or they can print it off and I, I don't have that concern. Right. I mean, that's that's really true. One of the things that I, I've gone back to a publisher textbook, but part of it is that I have the OER alternative, and so I'm sort of getting the best of both worlds because I get the publisher resources. And for my students that can't afford it, I link all the OER resources in my class, and they can choose. Right. Right. So that gives gives them both options for that, you know, and that's great because there are right. students that want a physical textbook. There are other students that just really can't afford it and, you know, they do have access to online so they can get it that way. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we yeah. have, um, I mean, sorry. I, that tends to keep all my students happy. Exactly, exactly. Um, we have passed our time, and so I just want to uh, see if there are any other questions. Post in the chat room very quickly or grab the mic. So I will give this about uh, three more minutes, and um, otherwise we'll wrap up if we hear no questions from the audience. And just real quickly, when you do exit, please make sure you click on the X in the right-hand corner of the software to exit Blackboard Collaborate. Thank you all. Um, really appreciate the speakers, by the way. Uh, amazing information today. Thank you so much.